Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney, and this is Caffeinated Crimes. Welcome to our Courtney and Jacqueline are both getting over a cold edition, so our voices are a little hit and miss here. Um, So we're going to do our best, and if we sound like groggy old men by the end of it, I'm really sorry. Thanks for sticking with us. (laughs) Yeah, so both of us kind of lost our voice doing everything we can to maintain it as long as we can. So maybe we sound sultry smooth or maybe we sound like the worst case of vocal fry you've ever heard. (laughs) Um, Hard to tell. I guess I'll find out when we edit. (laughs) Yes. Maybe I'll get that nice like Sophia Bush voice, you know? I mean, we can all only dream, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yeah. If only. Yeah. Um, So we wanted to say here at the top of the episode in case Once you get past the perk of the week and we start rattling off all of our social medias that you just skip on through, (laughs) um, we do want to remind everyone that we're still doing our Apple podcast contest. We are very, very, very close to 50. um, So hopefully we can get there before the end of the year. Um, So if you want to say it here, just go to Apple podcast on your iPhone. If you don't have an iPhone, I'm really sorry you can't. Maybe if you have a Mac, you can. Mm, I bet you can because you do have. So you probably could if you like have a Mac and not an iPhone, which I don't know if anyone out there is like that. But anyway, any Apple device, if you have an iPad, probably too. Mm -hmm. So just go on there and review it. Um, Please leave us five stars and then be sure and leave a comment. And you can either screenshot it and send it to us on any of our platforms. Or just put some, like, name that's, like, obvious it's you, Mm -hmm. basically. You know, like, clearly I can tell, like, who it is. So just be sure and do that. And then um, once we get to 50, we will pick one person who will get a pen, a sticker, and a $10 gift card to the coffee shop of your choice. So you can only win here. You can only win. Free (laughs) coffee. Free merch. So just go and do that. We would be very appreciative. Yes, definitely. And as a side note, like Courtney said, I would like to know if you, are you guys like an all Apple or all other, you know, Android, Mm -hmm. you know, like do do you mix and match your electronics, basically, is what I want to know. Do you have a MacBook, but not an iPhone? Do you have an iPad, but a Samsung phone? You know, I would just like to know if you, if you mix and match or if you kind of keep it consistent and go with all one or the other. Yeah, I'm all in Apple. Same. Personally, I have iPhone, um, an Apple computer, and an iPad. So I'm all in. I got AirPods. And I was like, I was like, our AirPods I mean, too. And- Steve Jobs family is doing <laughs> fine from us. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought that was interesting to think about. Anyway, I think that's all the uh, fun stuff because we know how much fun contest and free <laughs> stuff is. Are if anyway, um. So we do have one update from this week. Unfortunately, we are back to giving updates on weekly mass shootings. So this week, um, sophomore Ethan Crumbly did kill four students and injured seven others at Oxford High School, which is north of Detroit in Michigan. Um, He did have some odd behavior that was like leading up to this shooting. His teachers even tried to arrange a meeting with his parents and they were just very dismissive and like, basically didn't Mm -hmm. really care. Like, it was brought to their attention multiple times. Um, Very, like, disturbing behavior that made it pretty obvious that something like this was going to happen. Um, And they... And they did buy the gun for him, too. Yeah. So it had been a gift. And um, so he did kill 16-year-old Tate Meyer, 14-year-old Hannah St. Juliana, 17-year-old Madison Baldwin, and 17-year-old Justin Schilling. Um, And like I said, there were seven others that were injured as well. At the time of this recording, um, none of them have died from their injuries, but I know some of them were pretty serious, so um, there could be more fatalities from this. And this is the 28th school shooting this year as of December 2021. Um, Like we said, his parents were aware of the situation. They bought the weapon. They ignored these warning signs. Um, So James and Jennifer Crumley were arrested this week for manslaughter as well. After going, like, running and evading the cops, which was a big thing. So, (laughs) gotta love it. It's been... Have you seen the video going around that people have put on TikTok of the students in the classroom? 
Mm, no. So it was like these students in the classroom and they said it was like Ethan Crumbly at the door and he was like, Sheriff's office, like we're coming to get you to like whatever. And like the people in there were like, we we don't want to take that risk right now. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then he says like, well, you can come out and check my badge, bro. And they're like, bro, like an officer would never say bro. And you see them all like panicking because they're like, we know the shooters outside. And I'm just like, man, the trauma, the trauma you have to be dealing with from that. Mm. Like, how do you go back to school? Because that's the thing. It's like, obviously, this doesn't just affect those who were killed and their families and those who were injured. Like, everyone who was there that day, everyone who, like, knows someone who was there that day. You know, like, even Mm -hmm. if it wasn't you personally, but, like, your brother, sister, best friend, whatever. Just, like, like you said, how do you get over that, like, fear and go back to school? Um, And this is why we do these active shooter drills because the teachers and the students in that situation knew, oh, I shouldn't open the door to let this person in who says they're with the sheriff's office. Like, Mm -hmm. they've done this drill so they know that this isn't a safe behavior. So, I mean... I've seen people in comments, too, say that, like, in some school districts, like, they have a thing with the sheriff's department where, like, the teachers and the sheriff's department, like, know a code word. Mm -hmm. And, like, Mm -hmm. they'll say the code word. And if, like, they don't say the code word, like, you don't open the door or whatever. Like, kind of, like, things in place like that, which is good practice, but sucks that we have to have these things in general. Yeah, it really does. And speaking of things that sucks, we're going to go ahead and get into (laughs) today's episode. (laughs) So, our sources for today are a Lost Compassion documentary an episode of The Murder Squad called What Happened to Mytrice Richardson, um, season three of Helen Gone, and an article from the LA Magazine website. So 24-year-old Mytrice Richardson was arrested during a mental health episode and then released in the middle of the night with no transportation or money. Her body would be found 11 months later, and her death is still a mystery. So in 2009, Mytrice was working for a a clerical job for a shipping company and was interning for a psychologist. So she had graduated from Cal State Fullerton the year before with a degree in psychology and she was looking into a few grad schools. Um, And she was the first person in her family to go to college and she wanted to be a child psychologist. So she had recently come out as a lesbian and was dating a boxer named Tess. And Mytrice lived with her great-grandmother in Inglewood, which is a city that's in Los Angeles County. And on Friday nights, she was a go-go dancer at an LGBT club named Debra's in Long Beach. And Mytrice and Tess broke up in the spring of 2009. And shortly after this, Mytrice did become obsessed with a woman named Vanessa, um, who was a regular at Debra's, but Vanessa wasn't interested in Mytrice, so the feeling was not mutual. Mm-hmm. So in September, Mytrice began sending odd text messages to family and making odd posts on social media. So her family would later say they believe she had undiagnosed bipolar disorder. And on September 16th, she texted her mother and said, watch the news today. It's going to shock the hell out of you, which is a terrifying message to get. Yeah, for sure. And on her Facebook page, she posted, I just want to sleep, LOL, but you know me and my crazy ideas, dot, dot, dot. Let's see where they take me. So, Mytrice arrived at work that morning in a good mood, and she left for lunch, but she didn't return to work that afternoon, which wasn't like her. It wasn't like her to just be like, hey, I'm going to lunch, and never come back. <laughs> like, Which, I'm like, is... Are there people out there that that is characteristic for them? Like, do do people often just leave for lunch and not come back? Like, you know, in cases like this where they, like, emphasize, like, oh, that wasn't like her. And I'm like, do people, are people like that? Like, is that like some people? Like, I mean, (laughs) maybe there is, but. I guess maybe she was, like, at every shift, like, she wouldn't just, like, you know, be like, I'm leaving, I have to go. Or, you know, like, she was very, like, diligent, maybe, like, with her job. Which, like. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, like, me. now that I think back about some of my previous jobs and some of my coworkers, I'm like, actually, yeah, I can I can see that being characteristic of someone to go to lunch and not come back. <laughs> 
So she went back to her house and put her business cards with her dancer name, Hazel, all over the windows. And she also left a note on her uncle's car that said, Black Woman Scorned, with other scribblings. So Mitrice then went to visit one of her old college professors, and the professor took Mitrice over to a psychologist who worked in the building because she thought she was acting odd. And Mitrice kind of realized what was happening and ran away. So this woman was like, let's see if we can figure out here what's going on. And Mitrice just ran away. Which, like, I think it's amazing of that professor to attempt to do that because mm-hmm. I think some so many times in those situations you're like, oh, I don't want to assume something or I don't want to, like, intervene and, like, step out of bounds or whatever. But, you know, she took the time to be like, something seems off here. Like, let me see if I can help her, you know? So mm-hmm. I think that's really amazing that she did at least attempt to. Yeah, and at some point, my tree drove the 40 miles from South Los Angeles to Malibu and went to a high-end restaurant called Joffrey's. So when the valet returned from parking her car, he found her going through the glove box of his car. He asked if she was okay and told her, like, get out of my car. <laughs> you're, you're in my car here. <laughs> this is supposed to be the other way around here. Um. Yeah. So she responded saying, it's subliminal, which is very cryptic to say, yeah. like, okay. <laughs> So she was going through his CDs, and when she saw a Michael Jackson CD, she started talking about avenging his death. And she also asked the valet if he had seen Vanessa, although he didn't know Vanessa. So he did not know, like, who she was talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, she, you know, asked it so casually, like, have you seen Vanessa? Like, he should know who that is. And he's like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know who you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. So she told him to look for the girl with the tattooed arms So the host then led Maitrice to a table alone where she ordered a steak and a cocktail. And then she then joined like a table of seven strangers who were already eating and they didn't ask her to leave. So she just stayed at their table, which I'm like, I would probably, if someone just came and like had been sitting alone and sat with like my group of friends, I'd be like, I mean, okay, like, yeah. come on. <laughs> sure, why not? Also, depending on how many cocktails you had at that point, it's like, you're our new best friend. Come join us. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the diners did describe her as eccentric, and she said, like, something kind of seemed off, like, but also, like, if you see her drinking, you might just be like, that girl is drunk, <laughs> you know? So that could be kind of being, like, what you're assuming. Yeah, like, how many times, like, I know we all have stories of, like, that one crazy drunk lady at the bar, and it's, like, they're saying things like this. Yeah. Uh, You know, but they're saying things like this, and you're just, like, oh, like, that person's wasted. Like, this is funny. This is a good time. Like, you're never thinking, like, this is something more serious, you know? Which, a little side note that I have to tell this story. So, I was just um, at a bar today, and we were (laughs) sitting there, and there was this guy who I think was a regular at this bar, And he was sitting there next to this other man. And I don't know what happened. (laughs) I don't... They didn't know each other prior to this. I later deemed from what they were saying. Um, But something about, like, the putting the football games on the TVs caused them to literally start screaming at each other. (laughs) Like, they were yelling at each other. And he was like, this little punk. And you can't talk to me. You can't tell me what to do. And, like, honestly, I do not know how it did not turn into a physical fight. Because the one guy was like, quit talking to me. And he's like, you can't tell me what to do. Like, screaming at each other. And the bartender is like, y'all need to take it down. You're up here. Take it down. Mm -hmm. That's your personal space. Like, she's talking to them like they're five-year-olds. Like, these (laughs) grown-ass men. And then, I don't don't know what was said. But then they were like, (laughs) they were just like, He was like, I'm sorry. And he was like, I'm sorry, too. And he's like, let's take a shot together. (laughs) Then I swear to God, until I left, and I was there like all day watching football games, Uh until I left, these two men were talking. (laughs) And like best friends. After they had just screamed at each other. Wow. Wow. That is quite the story. Yeah. It was crazy. I was like, what is happening? And yeah, because the guy was like, I'm happy to meet you. I'm sorry we got off to a bad foot. And literally like showing each other pictures like talking each other's ear off the rest of the time so wow that's just my little side note of you know sometimes you just meet up with people at bars and you just talk to them and sit with them exactly so they said 
not not the men at the bar. We're back to the story, just so I can. I was like, maybe I should, should should make sure clarify. you guys know. So they said at one point she told them she was from Mars and she was trying to read their palms. Um, and she also asked about astrological signs and she said she was going to Hawaii and she would contact them when she got there. Um, the server also realized that something seemed off and he was afraid that she wouldn't be paying her bill. And he said he would notify the host when she had paid so they could avoid her trying to leave without paying. So maybe this is something that happened regularly. I don't know if he like knew warning signs or if he was yeah. just like, this girl's not going to pay. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so my tree started to leave the restaurant when her $89 bill came and the manager stopped her and asked how she was going to pay her bill. And she told them that the party she was sitting with should have paid her bill then said that he wasn't understanding the language of numbers. And the party had already left, and they had not paid for Matrice's bill, like she thought. Um, so she called her great-grandmother, who said she would pay, but the restaurant required a faxed signature, and her grandmother didn't have a fax machine, which I don't think most people do just randomly in their house. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, especially in 2009. I mean... Nowadays, most people don't fax, but maybe people working from home would have access to a fax now, but especially in 2009, and especially her great-grandmother, I mean. Yeah. So, Maitrice offered to settle her bill by having sex with the manager, and the manager did decline and told Maitrice that he would have to call the police, and she said okay and sat down at the bar. So, the restaurant then called the police and said a woman was acting crazy and refusing to pay her bill, and they said she may be on drugs and asked if they could come pick her up. Because that's another thing, too. If she's saying these things, you might not necessarily be like she's having, like, a mental mm -hmm. issue here. You might just be like, I think this girl is high. Like, yeah. high off her ass. <laughs> mm -hmm. So three police officers arrived around 9 p.m. and gave Matrice a breathalyzer and searched her car. So, the deputy spoke with her great-grandmother on the phone. Um, Maitrice did pass the breathalyzer, but they did find less than an ounce of weed in her car. So, she was arrested for defrauding an innkeeper and in possession of marijuana. And police had her car towed, which contained her cell phone, wallet, ATM card, and ID. So, they just took everything away. Mm -hmm. And they took her to a jail 13 miles away. So... Police would later claim that they arrested her because the manager of Joffrey's was demanding a citizen's arrest. So I guess this manager was pissed. Um, mm -hmm. And the manager later told Mitrice's family that he only did so because he didn't feel like she was in the right state of mind to drive. So he felt that her being in police custody was the safest situation for her, which I get because in a world where our police officers aren't pieces of shit like that should be the case but mm -hmm. as we see too often it's not but also and I mean we can talk about this more later but she had someone who was willing to pay her bill she, they just couldn't they're like their, their system would not allow someone to pay it over the phone but it's like she reached out to someone on the phone who was like yes I'll pay it like how do I do so I mean she had a connection to someone like could you not have been like can you call someone else to come get you can someone bring your great grandmother here with her card to pay like I know it's a good distance away but when they said like okay well we're gonna have to call the police she was like okay and she sat down at the bar and waited it wasn't like she like tried to get away mm -hmm. you know so it's like could you not have done something else to which I mean I get also like she's not paying her bill but again at the same time she had someone who was willing to do so which you know with everything that happens after you know hindsight is twenty twenty. but maybe let's not jump to calling the police first mm -hmm. thing Maybe. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know what this restaurant deals with. Like, if this is an everyday yeah. occurrence for them and they have people who are like, yeah, this person will pay and they don't, you know, yeah. which is an issue. Like, there should be a better assist. Like, someone else they should call besides police to help her yeah. if they think something like that. Like, it's, it's a tricky situation that I think is kind of, like shitty on both sides because you're kind of like yeah. I mean what do I do if I just keep letting people leave I'm gonna go out of business you know yeah, it's like definitely it's so hard in that position and you probably mm -hmm. get burned out too of people just like trying to rip you off so yeah so my Teresa's great-grandmother called my Teresa's mom 
Latisse Sutton to let her know that Maitrese had been arrested. And Maitrese had never been arrested or had any trouble with the law before. So Latisse called the Lost Hills Sheriff Station, which is part of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, to ask if Maitrese was going to be released that night or if she was going to be in custody overnight because she needed to know, like, when to come get her. Because, again, Maitrese's car has been towed away. Mm -hmm. And she's like, we're going to have to pick her up, obviously, so I need to know, do I come now? Do I wait till later? Yeah, and, like, you can hear um, the recordings are available online as well. But when she calls, she's like, you know, it's, uh, I think it was around 9 or 10 o'clock at this point. She's like, I'm not going to come sit there and wait all night if she's not going to get out until the morning. You know, if Mm -hmm. she's going to be released tonight, of course I'll come tonight. But if she's not going to be released till tomorrow, like, after an arraignment or something, I'll just wait and come then. I'm not going to sit there all night. And then um, I did see, too, that she had a younger sister, so she's like, why would I wake her up and drag her out in the middle mm-hmm. of the night to sit there all night if she's not even going to be released until morning, you know? Yeah, and she did tell police that Maitrese wasn't from the area, didn't have a car, she didn't have anyone to get home, and she just needed to make sure, like, when do I come get her? Um, and she said this was out of character for her, and she reiterated that she was worried about her safety if she were to be released that night. And eerily, she even said, I would hate to wake up to a morning report that she's lost somewhere with her head chopped off. Um, And the officer assured her that she would be safe. And Latisse said she wasn't concerned about her being in custody and said, it's being released that I'm worried about. It's crazy out here. So she's like, I just want her somewhere safe until I can come get her. Like, I just need to know. Yeah, like in the 911 call, the officer, like, it seems like he thinks that she's worried about Maitrese's safety, like, in the jail. And she's like, oh, no, like, she'll be fine in the jail. I'm worried about what happens if she gets released and has no way to get home, which as we'll see, is very eerie foreshadowing. And the officer told Latisse that her daughter would be held overnight, and then they released her at 12.15 a.m. with no car, phone, or purse. So, while close to the big city life of Malibu and Hollywood, the area around the Lost Hills Sheriff Station is very deserted with, like, nothing around for miles. There's no public transportation nearby, and actually this sheriff station, the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station, is the same place where Mel Gibson was taken to after drunk driving, and he was given a courtesy ride back to his car, Hmm. which helps to have money. Yep. Um, So Maitrese's car was towed, and she was released in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, with nothing. And, I mean, I'm pretty sure they say, too, like, this is, like, on a hill with like mm-hmm. winding roads and it's like there's you can't go anywhere like yeah. you're stuck like, there's nothing there's nowhere you could get to like unless someone's picking you up or you have a vehicle there's nothing that you can do being released there especially in the middle of the night yeah and my was su- supposedly arrested because the manager of joffrey's feared for her safety but police chose to release her alone and not order a psychological hold which Obviously, they should have if, like, Mm -hmm. everything the manager in the restaurant was saying, too, and her mom being like, this isn't like her. Like, Mm -hmm. maybe that should trigger something in your brain. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But the officers would later say that Maitrese didn't show any signs of suffering from mental illness, and there was no reason to hold her. So the woman in the cell with Maitrese also said that she was behaving normally, and she didn't suspect any any mental illness. And logbooks show that Maitrese attempted to call her great-grandmother four times after she was arrested. So deputies say they saw Maitrese talking on the payphone, but her great-grandmother said her phone never rang and she never talked to Maitrese that night. So when her mom contacted the sheriff's office early the next morning to ask about posting bond, she learned that Maitrese had already been released, but she knew her daughter didn't have any of her belongings and she hadn't heard from her So, of course, she is concerned. She was concerned before they even thought of her release. So, of course, now she's like, great. I asked for one thing, and you guys fucked up. Yep. She asked the officer about filing a missing persons report, but he said it was too early unless she had reason to believe that her daughter was in danger. Well, I mean, as anyone else listening to this knows, Latisse said she did think her daughter was in danger because... She was in an unknown area without a car or phone to contact anyone, and she hadn't heard from her. Her great-grandmother hadn't heard from her. Who else is she going to call on a phone she doesn't have? <laughs> like, Yeah. 
Um, and she also stressed to the officer that she was worried because she believed her daughter was in a depressive state. And the officer told her he would talk to the jailer and make sure she wasn't waiting in their lobby or something. And for her to call back in a few hours if she still hadn't heard from her. So the jailer later said that she told my Therese that she could stay overnight and have breakfast in the morning. And she seemed to think about it, but said she didn't want to spend the night in jail and would be meeting up with some friends. However, a sheriff's deputy said that he didn't recall if Maitrese was told that she could stay in the jail overnight if she wanted to or that her car had been towed. So, doesn't really seem like he, if Maitrese knew, mm-hmm. like, all of this. Like, two, two people at the station are giving conflicting information. And the person who was in charge of releasing her, of course, is going to say, like, oh, yeah, I told her that she could stay overnight and it was her choice and she decided to leave. Mm-hmm. But then someone else is like, yeah, I don't know if that's true. So, yeah. Yeah. Around 6.30 a.m., the day Matrice was released, a man named Bill Smith, who was a local television news reporter, called police to report a woman matching Matrice's description in his backyard. He saw her lying across the back steps of his house in a fenced-in backyard. Um, He asked her if she was okay, and she replied that she was just resting, but she quickly left. Um, Bill Smith lived about 5.5 miles away from the sheriff's office that Maitrese was released from. The next day, September 18th, Latisse reached out to psychologist Dr. Rhonda Hampton. So Dr. Hampton is the psychologist that Maitrese interned for, and Dr. Hampton contacted the L.A. Sheriff's Office and warned them that Maitrese was likely experiencing a mental health episode, and they needed to start their search for her immediately at right now you should have started 12 hours ago (laughs) yeah when her mom called and said she was released hours ago and we haven't heard from her so the sheriff's office transferred her case to the missing persons unit at the los angeles police department and when dr hampton contacted lapd later that day which was a friday she was told the detective assigned to the case had already left for the weekend so Dr. Hampton asked who would be handling it over the weekend and was told they would leave a note for the detective to get when she came in on Monday morning. You're telling me no detective was working. Like, this is the missing persons unit, and you're saying that your detective works Monday, Friday, 9 to 5, and no one's going to be working on it. People don't go missing on the weekend. No, of course not. And, you know, especially, like... We know how crucial the first 48 hours are when someone goes missing, but no, we're not going to work on it until Monday. You know, that's, that can wait. That's not a priority. But um, furthermore, the detective was actually there and had not left for the weekend and called Dr. Hampton back. So the detective told Dr. Hampton they would start a search the next morning. Yeah, so it seems like the, the detective on the case overheard this other person being like oh nope like she's already gone for the weekend like we'll give it to her monday and she's like i'm right here and so she called her back yeah so while waiting that night dr hampton started looking at my social media and found that she had made 66 posts from 8 25 a.m to 1 34 p.m on the day that she was arrested so clearly that is a lot that's very like rapid mm-hmm. posting um very odd things So the next day, the family wanted to take part in the search themselves, but they were instructed not to search certain areas because police were going to be searching those areas. So they're like, kind of feels like we're being like pushed out of this and like discouraged from helping because they're like, we're here, we want to look for our daughter, like what can we do? And they're like, oh, basically like avoid these areas. They're like, Mm -hmm. if we're searching for a, like this isn't a crime scene yet, like why would we be banned from searching certain areas, you know? Yeah. So, Latisse doesn't believe that Maitrese could have walked all the way to the house where she was last seen. Because, I mean, like we said, that's five and a half miles away from a place that's very, like, windy. It's very dark. It's not well lit. And, you know, she would have been walking all night and somehow ended up there. And she's like, I don't... And she also wasn't, like, outdoorsy. Like, she hated the outdoors. She didn't go hiking or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, any kind of, like, exploring or anything. Like, she wasn't an outdoorsy person. So, it's not like, oh, yeah, like, she's an adventurer and would have like gone on like trails and no. Um, so my footprints were found in front of the house. Um, so like we said, she was seen in the backyard, but they could see her footprints in front of the house. And it looked like they started walking and then changed to running before disappearing. 
So investigators weren't sure if her footprints disappeared because she moved into the woods so they couldn't see them anymore or if she was picked up in a car. Like they just like vanished. They're like, we don't really know what happened here. So the LAPD said that they would search for two days, which is weird that they would like put a time on it, but okay. Mm -hmm. But they actually stopped searching around 4.30 p.m. on September 19th, which was the day they started. So basically they searched like, a business day from like mm-hmm. eight to four. And one volunteer that was helping search was hanging flyers when a deputy from the sheriff's office spoke with them and said that Mitrice's family would turn her into a fugitive because she didn't want to be found. Um, he went on to say that her family may think they know her, but they don't, and that she was in a better place now. So, a very, very weird statement from yeah. a sheriff's deputy. That's a red flag. For sure. So the LAPD detective continued to share information with Dr. Hampton about the call they received from Joffrey, about Mitrice's behavior, some of the reports from the other patrons at the restaurant. Like she's, you know, sharing all this information, like she's trying to work with her. You know, we saw that she called her back after someone said she wasn't there. So it seems like this detective is like really trying to help and putting in some effort. But One day, Dr. Hampton called, like, the day after having a conversation with her and found out that the case had been reassigned. So, that's kind of weird. Even weirder, it was reassigned to the Robbery Homicide Division. And according to them, it was because they have more resources, not because they believed Mitrice was dead. I don't actually think that's how they work. That works, but, uh... No. What do I know? I... No. So, on January 9th, 2010... LAPD conducted a massive search for Mitrice in the area around the Lost Hills Sheriff Station. However, they did skip key locations that Mitrice would have likely walked through on the night that she disappeared. So places that seemed pretty obvious, like from point A to point B, they didn't search. Mm -hmm. And Mitrice's family had repeatedly been asking for surveillance footage from the night Mitrice disappeared, and they were told that the cameras outside were only there for live monitoring and that they did not record. Um, But on January 6th, they found out that they had been sitting in Captain Thomas Martin's desk the entire time. So he is the one telling them this footage does not exist and it's sitting in his desk. Not even like someone else was trying to cover up. He told them and had it and had it. So he claimed that he kept this footage in his desk in order to protect another individual that was seen in the footage. So kind of weird. Mm hmm. And it was three months before they were finally allowed to view the footage, but it had been edited. So LAPD claimed that they just removed sections of the footage that didn't include my trees, so it wouldn't be as long and the family wouldn't have to sit through as much footage. Okay. Another red flag. Mm-hmm. Um, and no one outside of LAPD has been able to, like, view the entire footage to confirm that. So this is just LAPD saying LAPD didn't cover anything up which is quite a theme for LAPD. <laughs> um, and her family reports that in one clip, Mitrice is holding a piece of paper. And in the next clip, the piece of paper is crumpled up on the floor. So they're like, okay, like you removed something in here of Mitrice doing something. Like what is it and why? Like why would you remove that? Mm-hmm. So they don't know what the sheriff's office was like trying to hide in between these clips and why they couldn't explain how this paper ended up on the floor, what was this paper, like they couldn't give them any of this information. And it wasn't until 2019, actually, that LAPD admitted to having footage both outside the building the night Mitrice disappeared, which they had seen, as well as footage from inside her cell. So they had this footage for a decade and they just then found out about it. So after watching this footage, Mitrice's mom said that she appeared childlike, distressed. She was like pulling at her hair and her cell. Um, After she was released, she picked up the phone and put it down again. Like she like couldn't get it to work. Like she would like put it to her ear and hang it back up. Um, So like shadows could be like seen in the background. So it seemed like someone's walking by and Mitrice is like trying to get their attention. And the family was previously told that there were no deputies in the station at the time of her release. But in the video, a deputy walks out of the station like two minutes behind my my trees. And it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, like you said, there were no deputies in the jail. Like it was just the jailer and the people who were there. Um, The, I don't want to say inmates because it's not a prison, but the people who were in jail. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. Is there a word for that? Anyway. 
I mean, they are called inmates even when they're in jail, but... Oh, my bad. It just seems so harsh. <laughs> it is It is pretty harsh, but um, <laughs> basically I know that because in the county I live in, you can look up the inmate population oh. and then like the 24-hour arrest list and stuff. So oh, Good to know. <laughs> so this deputy was transferred six months before my Teresa's family was allowed to view the footage. And his name has never been released. Red flag. But again, nothing, nothing sketchy going on here at all. Um, citizens also gave tips to volunteer searches this time um, about possible Maitrese sightings. One person said that Maitrese was being held in a trailer by white supremacists. Um, this info was turned over to LAPD, but as far as the, like, the citizens know who provided the information, it was never investigated. Um, so I did jump forward to 2019 to put all the footage information together but now we're going to jump back a little bit so just didn't want to confuse anyone or myself um so on july 9th 2010 the office of independent review issued a confidential report to the county board of supervisors so they reported that my arrest and release were by the book they found that she did not exhibit any behavior that would have warranted a psychological hold um which is confusing because that's supposedly the reason she was mm-hmm. arrested. Like the reason they, not arrested, but the reason they called police in the first place. Um, but they said there's no behavior that could have warranted that. Um, the report also did not include the phone call where Latisse tried to file a missing persons report only hours after my Therese was released. So there was record very early on that her mother was concerned about her. I mean, even before she was released, like, it was clear that her mother was concerned mm-hmm. about her. Um, but none of that was included in this report. Um, neither was the surveillance footage that was hidden in the captain's drawer for months. None of that in the report. That's not important. Um, the report does address the deputy that walked out of the station behind my trees, but they say that he couldn't have had anything to do with her disappearance because he was on official business with his partner at that time. However... That happened shortly after midnight, and Maitrese was then seen alive around 6 a.m., and we don't know, you know, what time Maitrese died, so this information shouldn't clear the deputy. Like, Mm -hmm. there's a a big time jump there. Like, again, we're not saying this deputy for sure had something to do with it, but you can't say, oh, well, he was working at midnight. Well, she didn't die at midnight, so that doesn't mean anything. Like, you said there were no deputies there, and now here's a deputy following her out of the station. The report also included a footnote that they did not interview any of the deputies or the station jailer who were present the night Maitrese was arrested and released. So I'm not quite sure how complete this report could be if you don't even interview the people who were present. Yeah. Then on August 9th, 2010, California State Park Rangers were inspecting the Santa Monica Recreational Area for marijuana plants. Um, So drug cartels were known to grow in this area, And while they were searching, they discovered scattered clothing. Nearby, they came upon partially mummified human remains in a creek bed. And based on her description and the clothing, they did quickly guess that the remains might belong to Maitre's um, because her case had received a lot of media attention at this point. So the mummified remains, like I said, were in a creek bed, which was down a steep slope and like past some really big boulders. So it wasn't like some easy to like stumble upon location like you basically had to go like through a very strenuous hike to get to this Mm -hmm. location where her body was found um the lost hills sheriff station was contacted that day and the sheriff station was then in charge of contacting the coroner and protecting the remains until the coroner arrived so deputies arrived at 1 30 p.m which is about 80 minutes after they were called and the state penal codes require that law enforcement notify the coroner immediately after human remains are found. However, the coroner wasn't contacted until 2.58 p.m., so about an hour and a half after the deputies arrived, and almost three hours after the deputies were informed of the remains in the first place. So just before 5 p.m., the coroner and his team were sent to the Lost Hills Sheriff Station, where they were told a helicopter would pick them up and transport them to the site of the body. So they waited over an hour and a half and were then informed by the sheriff's station that the helicopter had been sent to search for a missing hiker instead. So they're just like sitting around waiting, don't know what's happening. They're like, oh, actually, we had to use the helicopter for something else. Like, we'll get to you. Don't worry. (laughs) We'll put you in the queue. Yeah. So at 8 p.m., they finally arranged for a helicopter to pick up the coroner's team. 
Then, against the direction of the coroner, detectives from the sheriff's department had the remains airlifted back to the sheriff's station. So, the California State Code does state that a body shall not be disturbed or moved from the position or place of death without permission of the coroner or coroner's appointed deputy. The coroner was not able to investigate properly because he should have been able to examine the body in the location that it was found. I mean, like Forensic Science 101, you don't move the body. I mean, Mm -hmm. this is a person who has been missing for almost a year at this point. Like, it's very obvious that foul play is at least a possibility. Like, you can't just, oh, well, we're just going to go ahead and move her because... Why not? I don't know. We couldn't get a helicopter to get them here or whatever. What? No. So, Lieutenant Michael Rawson was supervising the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department investigators and stated that a coroner's staffer gave the deputies permission to remove the skull and inspect underneath it. So, he said when they removed the skull, the entire skeleton came up with it. And that's why they made the decision to just airlift all the remains out, which doesn't make sense. (laughs) You could just put it right back down if that happened. Um, This also doesn't add up with photos taken from the scene that show that the skull was already fully detached from the skeleton. So it wouldn't have just all come up with it. Um, Five neck bones also weren't even recovered until a later date. So again, this entire skeleton is not coming up with the skull. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Mitrice's body was found about eight miles from the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station and within two miles of where she was last seen alive, yet this area was not included in the searches that they conducted. And the coroner's office ultimately ruled her cause of death as undetermined. They could not say for sure that her death was a homicide. However, as we mentioned, the way the remains were handled did not allow for a complete investigation. So it's like, how can you even make that determination when you couldn't test anything? And during press conferences, detectives said that Mitrice's clothing could have been scattered by animals or by moving water, but even her underwear and her belt had been removed and they were, like, intact, so neither of those really seem plausible. Like, animals or water, like, carefully removing, like, your undergarments and your belt yeah. and they're still in good condition? I don't know. It doesn't seem uh, to line up. No. Um, Her teeth were also slightly pink, which could have indicated strangulation, um, but her hyoid bone was never recovered. So that would have given them like a pretty definitive like yes or no if she was strangled in that way. Um, But again, we have like the pink teeth that could have indicated that. So we have some signs, but nothing to confirm. And if this is like somehow your first podcast true crime episode you've ever heard, (laughs) The hyoid bone is a floating bone in your neck, so when you're strangled, when hands go around your neck, it has nowhere to go, and so it does shatter, and that's usually a good sign. Um, And so if somebody um, does, um, like, death by suicide, Mm -hmm. by hanging, um, the hyoid is able to slip under the rope, and so it'll be intact then, but if it's usually shattered then it's like strangulation because the it had nowhere to go so just in case like this is your first ever <laughs> true crime episode and you're like what is the hyoid i don't know what that is <laughs> yes thank you anthropologist courtney we appreciate you yeah that's your uh that's your courtney's facts corner <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they also did not conduct a second search of the area until six months after her body was found So you would think that they would want to do further investigation of this area at that time, but nope, I don't think so. Um, Some also speculated that her death was suicide, um, but there were no broken bones that would indicate an accidental or intentional fall. So it's like, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also unclear if Mitrice's body had been here all along because it was unusual that her body would be mummified not even one year later. And her clothing was still in fairly good condition. So, like, if her clothing had been, like, out here in the elements for almost a year, they probably would have been more deteriorated. And your body, like, wouldn't be mummified in, like, those weather conditions, most likely. Mm -hmm. So, the coroner's office performed very little testing on Mitrice's remains to try to find out what happened to her. Um, They didn't test the area around her to determine if that's where she died or if her body had been moved. Her clothing was also placed in the body bag with her before her funeral, and the coroner didn't even know that. Like, he didn't know where it was and hadn't examined the clothing. Like, they kind of, like, found it by accident right before her funeral. So, 
Both of Mitrice's parents filed lawsuits with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department over the way Mitrice's release was handled. They said that she should have been put under a psychological hold or they should have requested medical attention for her because of this bizarre behavior. And officers with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and Police Department were later found to be members of white supremacist groups. So that could mean something. I'm not saying it necessarily does, but mm-hmm. my Therese was a black woman. That could have meant something. Um, in 2015, Dr. Hampton submitted a complaint to the California Attorney General's office and asked them to review my Therese's case. Um, so they did reopen the investigation and they also determined that the Sheriff's Department deputies had not broken any laws. And in 2017, they said they found insufficient evidence to support criminal prosecution. So they're basically like, nope, everything was done correctly. Nothing we can do about it. So what happened to my Therese is still heavily debated. Um, Many believe that she was suffering from, like we said, bipolar disorder or another mental illness. Some sources did say that she had been diagnosed, but others say that she had not. Um, And her mother said that she was not on any medication. And, you know, her mother never explicitly stated that she was bipolar. So that would lead me to think that she probably had not Mm -hmm. been diagnosed because, like, your mom would know that. Um, So I think some of those that said that, Maybe you're just speculating because her behavior is very indicative of bipolar disorder, but I don't think she had been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So could she have walked all the way to Bill Smith's house where she was seen the next morning? Or did someone pick her up and take her there? Did something happen to her in that neighborhood since that was where she was last seen alive? Did she make her way to the area where her body was found? Um, And she found these drug cartel members who they knew had been in the area recently, like Did someone there have something to do with her? Did she die by suicide or just succumb to the elements? Like, she had no food, no water. Like, did she just get Mm -hmm. lost and stranded? Um, Her family is convinced that she was murdered and that the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department is either directly or indirectly involved. Um, Like we said, there were some white supremacist issues that came up later with some of these deputies. Um, The Lost Hills Sheriff's Station has also been the center of controversy with claims of sexual assault by officers and officers leaking sensitive information to the press. So they have come under scrutiny since then. Mm -hmm. Um, So even if deputies didn't actually harm Mitrice, which a lot of people believe is what happened, her family still believes that they are responsible because they released Mitrice in the middle of the night with no phone, car, money, or access to public transportation. Um... And again, Mitrice's mom made it very clear when she called the station that night that Mitrice didn't know the area and wouldn't be safe if she were released without someone to pick her up. But yet, that's exactly what they did. Just released her into the middle of the night with no way to get a hold of anyone. Yeah, and I'm also thinking too, like, we have that um, that video that's clearly like things have been edited out. And so it's again, what happened in those edited out minutes that you're not telling. Like, you're obviously under scrutiny yeah. because you're having, like, malpractice, basically. And now you're, like, mm-hmm. hiding part of a video. Like, you're just making yourself look more guilty. Yeah, and, like, you had this video surveillance. You're like, oh, I'm protecting someone else. And it's like, okay, if you were able to edit the video to, like, take out chunks, you could edit the video to, like, cover up an innocent person's mm-hmm. face. So if it was like, oh, there was someone else in the jail, like, we don't want their you know, face exposed to whatever, you know, you can blur it out. Like, that's Mm -hmm. not unheard of. Like, if you're able to edit it to remove sections, you can edit that as well. So why would you do it that way? Like, you, and again, no one outside of the sheriff's department can, like, has seen the footage to be like, oh yeah, like, we confirm that this is all that was removed or whatever. Like, again, just good old LAPD saying that good old LAPD did not do anything wrong. Yeah, gotta love it. But yeah, like I said, a lot of people do think that, like, the deputies did something to her. A lot of, like, Mm -hmm. again, this is one of those cases with a ton of theories. They're like, oh, they were white supremacists. Like, this is a very, like, ritzy white area. And you have this black girl who's not from the area. And I find it interesting that there was a report that she was being held by a white supremacist that was never investigated. And then people Mm -hmm. in your department, like your sheriff's department were found to be white supremacists like that to me and like with her body like the state of her body and stuff I'm like yeah that is pretty weird that you have this report that was never investigated 
And then you have yeah. people in the station are like actual white supremacists. <laughs> yeah, like were later found and like reprimanded for being part of these organizations. But yeah, like the way that the location that her body was found and like the condition of her body and her clothing is like, was she being held somewhere? Like, we have no idea when her Mm -hmm. time of death was. Like, was it when she went missing or was she kept alive for months? Like, we have no idea of knowing. So was she held in a trailer with white supremacists? Like someone said, were the detectives part of this white supremacist group? Yeah. I don't know. Did they have nothing to do with it? Was it the drug cartels that they were like searching for their marijuana plants at the time? Did she accidentally end up there? There's just so many questions, but... Or, I mean, was she out in the wilderness? Maybe not entirely of a sound state of mind and succumb to like the wilderness. And yeah, I feel like I remember to... Didn't they say it gets like kind of cold in this area yeah, at night? At night, yeah. So, and she might not have been properly dressed for that because I mean, it's LA. It's usually like 80, 90 degrees every day. So, that actually, that was another thing that came up um, as far as her clothing like being remained and scattered away from her body because people were like, maybe it was hypothermia because mm-hmm. when you go through hypothermia and your body is so cold, you feel so hot. So, you start taking off all mm-hmm. of your clothing, trying to cool yourself down. Um, so someone was like, oh, like, maybe this is what happened. But then they're like, did it get cold enough that hypothermia, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like maybe yeah. that combined with, like, no food and water and things like yeah, that could she be a was out there for, like, days and, like, yeah. no one found her and, you know, who, who knows, you know, what. But, or, I, mean, I mean, if it, you are outside, like, in the middle of the woods and you yeah. don't know where you are, like. Yeah, so, again, it's like. Even if the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department and Police Department had nothing, like, directly to do with it, like, their deputies did not kill her or anything like that, like, I feel like they're kind of to blame here for the way that they Mm -hmm. handled her release. Again, they did come out and say, like, oh, she was told, like, she couldn't, um, she was told that she could stay here overnight and she chose not to, but it's, like, the reason... You were called out in the first place was because someone was supposedly concerned about her mental health, that they didn't feel like she was in the right state of mind, but yet you're like, oh, she didn't show any weird behavior when she got here, so so we couldn't do, like, a psychological hold or anything like that. It just, it doesn't all add up. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of red flags in this case. Yeah. So, um, but super, super sad. Um, you know, obviously her family's her family was searching for her for a long time. And then, um, you know, once her remains were found, still didn't really get closure because they still have no idea what happened to her. Um, again, we did mention the resources at the top of the episode, um, that go into like a lot of detail and they have interviews with the family and, you know, recordings from that night and stuff like that. So definitely check those out if you want, you know, kind of a deeper dive than we're able to provide. Um, but definitely let us know if you guys have any thoughts on, you know, what happened to my trees and just super sad situation. Mm -hmm. So all that being said and being sad, um, (laughs) Courtney, what is your perk of the week? Okay. My perk of the week is this weekend was my bridal shower. So mm-hmm. it was very fun. I was very nervous beforehand because <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, all these people are going to be here for me and like looking at me and that's <laughs> really scary. Like what's happening? Um, but it was so fun. It was absolutely beautiful. It was like there was a mimosa bar and like a like a brunch, like buffet kind of thing. And mm-hmm. there was like a like nice little hint at like Beauty and the Beast. So a little bit of a theme there, but like not over the top and the cake was so good. It was really, really fun. And we played a lot of fun games. Um, so it was a lot of fun and I, it was nice having like all these people who I love coming around and Kevin's parents Mm -hmm. came into town to come. So we just got to hang out with them this weekend and that was always fun. I always love seeing them. Um, so yeah, that is my perk of the week because it was super fun and I love seeing people. (laughs) Yeah, the pictures were gorgeous. Um, I'm super sad that I wasn't able to be there in person because just would end up being a lot of trips to Tennessee in the next three months. (laughs) Um, 
but uh, I did get to FaceTime in and they propped me up on a table so I could uh, participate in the in the games <laughs> and the, I could look at the delicious food and mimosas, but you know, I couldn't have any. <laughs> One day we need to invent that. Well, now we got video calls. Now we need to invent like teleportation the sharing of, yes, <laughs> I was going to say taste, but that works too. <laughs> so. But yeah, so that is my perk of the week. Jacqueline, what is your perk of the week? Um, so my perk of the week is this week we got Millie's six month portraits done. Um, I'm so excited to see them when they all come out because the little preview that she showed me are just like so cute. They're like Christmassy themed and she's got her cute little outfit on and her giant bow and, um, it's just precious. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was super fun and I've given her a shout out before, but she is shot with a bow photography if you are local to Richmond, um, or she will travel as well. Mm -hmm. So definitely, um, check out her Instagram and her website and all that fun stuff, um, because she is just fabulous and she's done all of our photos since we've been here and they're all amazing and I'm obsessed with them. So definitely check her out if you are in need of a photographer anytime soon. Yeah, having pictures done is always so fun and like waiting to get them back and like looking at them all is always like so fun. Mm -hmm. And we did, um, so Millie had like a little like plaid uh, vest and Andrew's like, oh, like we need to get matching flannels. So like we went to Bass Pro and we got matching flannels, but I, they didn't have any um, women's that match. So I had to get a small men's and then I was trying to like arrange it and then I just and I literally changed my outfit as we were like walking out the door because I'm like I don't want to wear this I don't feel cute in this I'm not going to be comfortable in it so I wore something else (laughs) so which you know I think it turned out good because ours didn't exactly match Mar babies so that way you know but I wore like complimentary Mm -hmm. colors so I think it'll be okay but anyway it was just funny because I'm like I literally sent Courtney three pictures that morning as I was trying to decide like hours before how to wear it and then we're like walking out the door and I was like nope I'm getting another shirt (laughs) Fuck this shirt. (laughs) So, But if you want to tell us about um, your weekend, any pictures you're having done, your bridal shower, (laughs) your favorite mimosa, I don't know, whatever, you can do so on Instagram (laughs) at Caffeinated Crimes Pod, on Twitter at Caff Crimes Pod, that's C-A-F-F Crimes Pod, on Facebook at Caffeinated Crimes Podcast. You can email us at caffeinatedcrimespod at gmail.com. We are on YouTube, that's Caffeinated Crimes Podcast, and on TikTok, although we haven't posted in a while because I'm not creative, Caffeinated Crimes, <laughs> you can follow us there, we have a few. Um, and if you do feel so inclined, if you would um, want to send a little money our way to make this show the best it can be, and you'll get uh, some good perks too, like a Discord channel and a pen, a sticker, you get um, monthly hangouts, quarterly gifts, like... A bunch of stuff that's really all fun and awesome. A bunch of bonuses. Um, you can do so at patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes. And I won't go into it too much because we did it at the top of the episode. But if you've reached this point and you still have not left a review on Apple Podcasts and you have that capability, please go do so because we would love to get 250 and in this contest and stop saying this every week. So do that. Yes. But in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. Thank you.